The four men sat in a circle and sipped their drinks. Mr. Andrew Radisson was dressed in a white suit with a red tie and white wingtip shoes. He had a white fedora and a black thorn cane with an ivory handle in the shape of a tiger. He had thick white hair and a neatly combed mustache. His skin was pale from spending most of his life indoors, but it was remarkably smooth for a man in his seventies. Across from him was a short, fat, bald man with a tailored black suit and a fat cigar hanging out of his mouth. The fat man, Arthur Oswald, was the owner of a distinguished publishing house. He was about a decade younger than Mr. Radisson, but the way he ate, drank, and smoked, it was likely that he would die sooner than his friend. Next to them was Professor James Blackstone, a man of about average height, with a slight gut. He had hair around the outside of his head, but his crown was bald, with only a few wispy strands to protect his head. He wore a brown suit with elbow patches, and he was busy filling his pipe with tobacco as the other men talked. There were two other men at the table, Mayor Brian Rockford and Tom Williams, the local reporter. Mayor Rockford was dressed in a gray suit. He had neatly combed his blonde hair and shaved his face for the occasion. Tom wore a pair of tan slacks and a casual button-down shirt. He also had neatly combed hair and a clean-shaven face, and he wore a badge around his neck that said, Press. The four older men talked with each other while Tom listened. He was supposed to interview the mayor later that day, but the men had invited him to lunch and he felt it would have been rude to turn them down. They sat at the mayor's house. The four men had brought their families together to celebrate Easter. Their wives were sitting at another table, talking about children and grandchildren, as said children and grandchildren played games in the yard. The children tossed beanbags and played tag in the background while the men enjoyed their conversation. Did you hear about the murder on Washington Street? Mr. Radisson asked. I've hardly heard about anything else, Mayor Rockford said with a snort as he rolled his eyes. I'll be happy when the whole thing blows over. That definitely was a nasty bit of work there, Brian, Oswald said. Poor guy was butchered in his sleep. I ain't never seen nothing like that in all my years. It's definitely not what you would expect from a quiet town, Dr. Blackstone said. Do you know why the man was killed? Mayor Rockford just shook his head. Oh, how should I know, he said in exasperation. Why don't you ask Mr. Williams here? I believe you covered that story. I did, Tom said hesitantly, but I don't think anyone really knows anything about the murder, and if the police do know anything, they haven't told me. Didn't his wife say a disgruntled employee killed him? Mr. Oswald asked. Tom shook his head. According to her, her husband's ghost came back from the dead to tell her who killed him, he said. That's hardly evidence. What's the matter, Tommy? Mr. Oswald asked. Don't you believe in ghosts? Is that a serious question? Tom asked. Perhaps it is, Mr. Radisson said. Stranger things have happened. I highly doubt that, Tom said, rolling his eyes at the idea. Each of the men stared back at him earnestly, though. Oh, please. You don't actually believe she saw her husband's ghost, do you? Maybe she did, Mr. Oswald said. Lord knows Janet says she'll haunt me after she's gone. She would have to die first, Dr. Blackstone said, looking at Mr. Oswald's stomach. And I think we all know that isn't going to happen. Mr. Oswald looked offended, but he set down the piece of pie he had been eating. Tom shook his head in bewilderment. So you guys seriously believe in ghosts? Dr. Blackstone sat back in his chair and stared at his feet. After a long moment, he answered Tom. I don't know if I believe in ghosts or not, he said slowly, but I have seen things. Things that I can't explain. Tom rolled his eyes. Like what? he asked. Well, and I don't expect you to believe this, mind you. But it was enough to convince me, he said with a distant look in his eyes. It was back when I was out on an archaeological dig. We were out in southeastern Iraq, excavating a town near the city of Lagash. It used to be green and fertile, but it is a desolate land now, and there is no real semblance of law and order. The people in that country lived in poverty, and out near Lagash, the only signs of civilization are several thousand years old. We had to carry most of our supplies, and we had to have others come to resupply us every few days. I was excited to be there. I had been on several archaeological ventures before. They are all similar in a lot of ways, but they are also all unique. You never know what treasures you will dig up out there. It was my first trip to ancient Mesopotamia, and I was eager to start excavating the area. We hope to find a few houses and artifacts, pottery shards perhaps, and some eating utensils as well. Maybe even some jewelry too. 
In those lands, you're almost guaranteed to find cuneiform tablets. The Mesopotamians wrote down a lot of information, mostly legal documents or business records, but occasionally stories and even recipes. The village had been discovered on a previous dig by a local boy, maybe 13 or 14, who had tripped on a brick while carrying water to the camp. The previous archaeologist could hardly believe their luck. We came back the following summer to uncover the village and comb it for forgotten artifacts. In total, it ended up being about two football fields in diameter. It was much bigger than we had expected, and there was good reason to hope that there might be something significant there. It would be an incredible find that would add to our historical knowledge of the region. You can imagine how enticing that would have been to a young archaeologist. And of course, I wasn't alone. We had four other archaeologists, two men and two women, as well as twenty or so students. It took us nearly two weeks of non-stop digging to dig up the perimeter of the town. We might have spent the whole summer digging too if it hadn't been for a peculiar turn of fate. One of our students, a girl by the name of Sarah, stumbled onto another major find within the city. She found a temple for the god Ninurta. Despite being a total accident, it was still a very important discovery. He was the patron god of Lagash, and a find like that would have been a massive boon to her career. Not many college students can say they have made a find of that significance. We continued to excavate the town, of course, but the temple became our chief priority. It was mostly buried, and it looked as if it had been destroyed in a battle of some sort. We would have missed it entirely if the poor girl hadn't fallen into the lower levels of the temple. She was stuck at the bottom for almost an hour while we tried to find a way to reach her safely. Fortunately, she wasn't hurt in any serious way, and we were able to pull her out of the temple with some ropes. And just like that, the camp was abuzz with activity. Of course, we had to make a more permanent way of going back and forth between the surface and the temple, and as soon as we managed that, we had set up a photo shoot. You might think something like that would be trivial, but a discovery like that was bound to attract patrons who would fund further excavations, and the photo might be important for various archaeology magazines. I still have that picture. I look at it often and think about her. We had placed her in front of a relief depicting Ninurta, with his wings and his mace, Sharur. He was a god of war and agriculture, two of the more important aspects of Sumerian life, and the relief showed him fighting the bird demon Anzu. We had Sarah pose so that it looked like she was looking up at the god in awe. It was a very powerful photo, and it really captured the enormity of the discovery. I admit, at the time I was slightly jealous of the young lady. I can't say I'm exactly jealous of the poor girl now, but I can still gladly say I would have happily traded places with her. Later that week, the girl fell ill. It was the most horrible thing I had ever seen. She became pale, and sores spread over her body, filling with black pus. She began vomiting green bile, and she lost weight rapidly. We immediately called for medical help, but they were too late. She died before the end of the week. Needless to say, we were all heartbroken at the loss of the young girl, and to our shame, we were more than a little scared of what had killed her. As near as we could figure, there must have been some ancient virus that had remained dormant inside the tomb. It seemed like the only possible answer. She must have breathed in the disease from the dust of the tomb. We declared the tomb off-limits, and we placed her body over a quarter of a mile away from our camp for our own safety. We placed a tarp over her body and weighed it down with rocks hoping to keep the wild animals away from the poor girl until medical help could arrive to take her away. I remember thinking that was the end of it. I had hoped so, but our troubles were far from over. The night after she died, three more students went missing. We followed their footsteps to the tomb. We were furious that the students had gone into the tomb after it was declared off-limits, but when we reached the tomb, we found a fourth set of footprints. It led back to Sarah's corpse. It was as if she had gotten up and walked to the tomb. To our amazement, her corpse was still underneath the tarp, completely undisturbed. None of us knew what to make of it. None of us were eager to go inside the tomb either, for fear of a disease, and we decided to draw lots. I drew the short straw, and they lowered me down into the tomb. Fear gripped me, and I moved as quickly as I could, trying to limit my exposure. I called out to the students, hoping to find them, but there was no answer. Finally, I went into the inner temple, and I found the students there. The two men who had gone missing, and the woman who had gone missing with them, were all prostrate on the ground in front of the altar to Ninurta. They were all dead, and they were covered with the same boils as Sarah. After that, we started imposing stricter measures. 
We began packing up our camp and finishing up with any tiny excavations that we could. I was isolated from the others the whole time. One of the senior archaeologists brought me food, but she made sure to leave it several yards away from me. She was afraid of getting sick like Sarah and the other students. I don't know all the details. I was isolated from the rest of the group, you see. Still, I knew they implemented a strict curfew, and they began keeping watch as well to make sure no one snuck off in the night like the students had. Our situation only became worse as the days wore on. The next night, another two students went missing, and the night after that, it was one of the senior archaeologists. They sent me back into the tomb to check and see if they were inside, and each morning I would find the missing people prostrate at the altar. Of course, they tried telling themselves that it was just a sickness that was spreading through the camp. I did too. That thought was frightening enough. Still, we became more and more afraid that something more sinister was happening. I did my best to ignore those thoughts. Like you, I was skeptical of these sorts of things. I still am skeptical, but it is hard for me to explain what I saw any other way. We were ready to leave by then, and we would have, but a storm came out of nowhere and made it impossible for us to travel without getting lost. Instead, we hunkered down in our tents and waited for the storm to pass. That very night, as I tried to sleep, I heard a scream that chilled my soul. I looked out of my tent to see who it had been, but I couldn't see anything. Suddenly, the lightning flashed in front of my eyes, and I saw a woman walking out in the storm. She was walking towards the temple. I tried calling out for help, but the others were too far away. The storm was too loud. I knew that if I went to fetch them, I would be too late. So I ran into the storm, barefoot, dressed in pajamas, with only a flashlight. Rain poured down in sheets, and the wind whipped against my face but I barely even noticed. I ran after the woman, trying to stop her. I couldn't even admit it then. Even after everything I had seen, I still couldn't admit it to myself. But I knew in my gut that the temple was cursed, and if that woman entered it, she would die and become just like the others. I didn't know how I knew it, or why, but I knew the only way to save the girl was to keep her out of the temple. I chased after her, desperately trying to reach her before she could enter the temple, but I was too late. The lightning flashed, and I saw her standing before the entrance, and in the next instant she was gone. I should have run back and warned the others, but I followed her into the temple, climbing down our makeshift ladder into the darkness below. It was pitch black, and even with my flashlight I could barely see anything. I called out in the darkness after the girl, but there was no response. I didn't know which girl was in the tomb with me, but too many people had gone missing already. I pressed further into the tomb. I could feel my heart racing, and I broke out into a cold sweat. Fear gripped me, and I was seized by the sudden impulse to run, to just flee out into the storm, and to leave everyone and everything behind. Maybe it would have been better to run, but I forced myself to stay. I had to know who was in the tomb. I had to save her. I pressed forward. I could feel the cold stone floor underneath my feet, and my heavy breathing echoed off the walls. There was a musty taste in the air, like mold or rot. The storm howled outside like demons screeching and wailing. I began to shiver, not from the cold, but from the terror I felt. But there was no going back, not before I tried to save her. I came to the inner sanctum, where I had previously found the bodies. The thick wooden doors had been closed and barred, preventing me from entering. I began to hear voices on the other side of the door, and I called out to the girl, but there was no response. I banged on the door, and the voice grew louder, and they began chanting in Sumerian. I put my shoulder to the door and pushed with all my weight, but it wouldn't give. The voices grew louder until they drowned out the storm, and I had to cover my ears. I felt like my heart might pound out of my chest. Finally, when I couldn't take it anymore, the voices stopped. There was nothing but utter silence on the other side. It carried on that way for what seemed like forever. I didn't dare break the silence by making even the slightest of noises. Just when I thought it might be safe to speak, the wooden doors creaked and groaned. They swung open slowly, revealing the inner sanctum. I couldn't stop my hands from shaking, and the light from my flashlight began bouncing all over the walls. I managed to catch a glimpse at something, and I gasped. I did my best to trade the light on the thing I had seen, but my hands were trembling too much. I saw a woman walking towards me. It was the woman from the storm. I called out to her, but she didn't utter a word. I cried out for her to stop, but she kept moving steadily forwards. 
She had the same sores on her body as the other victims had had, and she began retching violently as she walked towards me, spewing the same green bile that Sarah had thrown up before she died. I didn't think of being sick then. That was no longer what scared me. I had tried to identify the girl before, but in that moment all I could do was pray that she didn't show her face. She drew closer to me and raised her hands towards me, causing me to recoil in horror. I wanted to run away, but my legs had betrayed me. I couldn't move. I was begging with her, pleading with her to stay away, but she kept walking towards me. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, she raised her head, and I could see her face with my flashlight. It was Sarah! She had been dead! I was sure of it! I had checked her myself and seen her with my own eyes. She had to have been dead. Her face was bloated and rotting, and she smelled like putrid meat. I cried out when I saw her. It couldn't possibly be her. And yet, I had my own eyes for witnesses. She stood before me, that dead thing, and she stretched out one finger and pointed at me. It was then that I saw what was behind her. All of my companions were with her, both the dead ones and the living ones. No, that isn't quite right. None of them were living. Not anymore. It was like something out of a nightmare. And I wanted to close my eyes and make it all go away. But my eyes were fixed on the dead things in front of me. They were all sick and decaying, and all of them were unearthly pale. They all began to march towards me in unison. My terror broke like a thunderclap, and my legs began to work. I ran from that place towards the ladder, not daring to look back. The whole temple began to shake and collapse around me and I barely made it out in time. Even then, I didn't look back. I ran through the night, ignoring the storm. I didn't bother to take anything with me. I simply ran in the general direction of Lagash. The storm raged the entire night, and it wasn't until morning that I found the city. I was taken in by other archaeologists, who promptly put me in the hospital for hypothermia and delirium. I must have sounded like a madman. I suppose I was a madman, but I had to warn them. Despite my warnings, they went to the town and found our camp, but only my tent. Everything else was buried beneath the sands. I think about them all the time, you know. I've talked to doctors and psychologists, and they all think I'm crazy. They think I had some sort of mental breakdown in the desert. Who can blame them? I scarcely believe it myself. But no amount of rationalizing the event has ever convinced me that I didn't see what I saw. Perhaps I am crazy. Who knows? But I know what I saw, and I know there is no scientific explanation for it. If there was, I would have found it already. Tom sat back in his chair. Well, you certainly have a gift for tall tales, he said, folding his arms. You expect me to believe that? Not really, Dr. Blackstone said with a haunted look in his eyes. But I believe it. Well, why don't you tell me the truth about what happened, Tom said. The truth? Dr. Blackstone asked to no one in particular. After a moment, he met Tom's gaze and stared straight into Tom's eyes with an almost defiant expression. What do I know about the truth? You want the truth? It's buried in the desert outside the gash.